conference. We are back where we began with Kit Malthouse and Charlie Ledbetter this morning with the City and Innovation. It's my great pleasure to welcome um, Mike Geroff from MIT in Massachusetts and, and Peter Miskovich from JLL. And they're going to summarize their learnings from a very exciting unconference session we held yesterday in Lab 39 here, where leading experts gathered to debate the city as a platform for innovation. The platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think Peter will agree with me. It's hard enough to go on stage at 4 o'clock after a really good, busy two days. It's even harder going after the poet laureate of the workplace. <laughs> but thank the gods that it wasn't after the sperm bank talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate Love I can handle. The other one I had a little trouble with. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I'm Mike Jaroff. I'm based at MIT. But just a brief word of background. I've been spending the last 15 years literally working in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, and the Americas, advising complex partnerships of government, developers, universities, and uh, build these clusters, what we'll talk about, knowledge innovation clusters. And so that's just enough of a background. But I mean, I've been doing it. And we have viewpoint, and I think I'll start by saying, that I'm glad the original the group, the early cluster group, went at 1 o'clock, I think, or 2 o'clock. I mean, basically everything they say I agree with, and I don't have to say that again. But we'll talk about a little bit clusters a little bit differently than they did. Peter, do you want to introduce yourself briefly, then I'll start? Yeah, hi, I'm Peter Miskovich uh, with Jones Lang LaSalle. I've uh, known Mike Jarrah for over 20 years. And uh, today we'll be presenting an overview of uh, Mike's work in the area of innovation clusters and districts. And then we'll share with you the summary a very interactive dialogue we had yesterday with a panel of uh, four, with Mike and myself, and about 20 others who were part of that uh, interactive discussion. So with that, Mike? Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, the, the interesting question that was asked of the group before was, what's a cluster? And it's the kind of thing you ask 12 experts about a cluster, you'll get 14 answers. But I mean, so what they were talking about is a cluster. We'll talk about is a totally different scale. It's also a cluster. So think of these things as platforms that build upon one of another, OK? The basic platform we'll talk about is the city, large scale areas of the city that are equivalent to half of East London, all right? Or Canary Wharf, which is huge, not just the individual place. So, but again, what they're saying is not wrong about being a cluster. It's just a different layer, a platform. So let me go through these things. Again, I want to stress that what we talk about are, are similar in characteristics and performance in DNA but they're on a spectrum. Right? One end of the spectrum is where Canary Wharf used to be 15 years ago. All it was was an aggregation of companies in the same business. They shared some facilities, and that's about it. They weren't trying to change the industry. They were just supporting the industry. On the other end of the spectrum are the clusters I'll talk about now, which are really meant to not only change the economy of a city or sometimes a nation, but are trying to reform and reformulate entire industries. And they're bigger, all right? And they're more comprehensive. So and in between are somewhere these innovation districts. So I'm not going to draw sharp lines because the lines are fuzzy, but they're different. So I just say they're platforms, one on top of the other, each feeding each other. Uh, where is that coming from? Oh, yeah. So I mean, basically, the, 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 the clusters are physical developments, but they're also development of human social capital. And they're totally intertwined. You only have a physical place, it would go into it's also a virtual place, because they support each other. Right? So what we're talking about developing human capital, we're talking about knowledge generation, knowledge capture, and knowledge application. So everybody talks about you know, the wonderful things that are happening now in social media based upon the internet. Well, the, a real cluster at some of the we're talking about were evolved with the internet 50, 60 years ago. The internet was invented 60 years ago. So I mean, so the clusters have all these things that go from knowledge generation, knowledge capture, knowledge application. The other thing I want to stress, I mean, nowadays we constantly are celebrating young people. You know, everybody knows Mark Zuckerberg, everybody knows uh, Marisa Meyer, and we always think of young people, but I really want to stress it's not just about young people, it's about youthful people. So the guy on the bottom, the right, is a guy named Bob Langer. 
institute professor at MIT. Bob Langer is in his 50s. Bob Langer has 140 patents in biomedicine. He started 28 companies. He's probably trained a thousand, trained a thousand people in this industry. All right? So let's not just think about an age group. It's multiple ages. In America, I don't know what it is here, in America, 40% of all new SMEs are started by people over 50. So again, I'm not saying good, different, we just can't think of only the internet and young people. It's a whole spectrum of things these clusters support. Again, same thing with firms. Al Alibaba, which is now one of the hottest market companies in the world, is 20 years old. Google's 30 years old. MIT and Stanford, which in America are the driving you know, universities, <coughs> innovative universities. One's 100 years old, one's 150 years old. Cambridge University, which is equal to any in the world, is what, 700 years old? So it's not only new, right? And I think it came out today. It's capturing all these and seeing how they can benefit one another. <coughs> Everybody thinks of the major cluster being Silicon Valley. Well, Silicon Valley, I mean, has done a lot of things. What people don't realize is that Silicon Valley is a huge cluster. It's like 40, 50 miles of stretches. Most of the clusters we're talking about are within, within a confined area, you know, the size of half of East London or West London, where you now have Imperial College and BBC joined to develop a cluster. So most of them are confined geographically. The one around East Cambridge, Kendall Square, with MIT at the heart, is probably one of the better ones, all right? <laughs> and it's, it's well known about it. But again, what the cluster now has are four different industries. Life sciences, computer science and media, nanotechnology, and energy. And, and this is the third iteration of this cluster. It's third lifestyle. 80, 50, 60 years ago after World War II, it's all about large-scale electronic systems that grew out of World War II. So missile guidance system. Then became computers and computer sciences, the new media. But what's interesting about these clusters now that's there, this benefits from everything that went before. For example, life sciences, they're looking at DNA, right? And about illness and DNA. Well, you find something, you cannot deliver it with a pill. You deliver it by moving to the gene, and you need nanotechnology to do it. And you cannot see DNA, you cannot see nanobits. That's why computer sciences is we have to image them. So all these things fit together not in a collaborative way, but a transdisciplinary way where everything's invented at the same time. So the physical part obviously matters. We will, I mean, we, we, obviously we do things connected, but you still have physical base. So in this cluster, you have offices, laboratories, R&D spaces, teaching and learning spaces, startup places, incubators, accelerators, direct customer service, manufacturing and making everywhere places. So it's not one thing, a cluster is healthy, has everything going on. And again, I think that Mark made a really good point this morning. And people go where they have to go, right? People go where they have to go. And they, they're smart enough to know, if you're investing in a company, you gotta trust them to know where they're gonna work or they'll figure it out. And a lot of those spaces, by the way, are shared. Increasing their share. One of the great places at MIT, and MIT was the first place to do it, they joined together the Department of Biology at MIT in a private institute in one. So everybody was, you know, went back and forth and they worried about intellectual property. They solved the problem. All right, so it's a shared space. Who owns it? Both own it. And the fact that it worked three Nobel Prize winners says something about its success. But again, so in effect, if you look at this cluster around here, it's from laboratory to factory. And the laboratory doesn't have to be a physical laboratory. It can be, you know, IT, but it's there physical too. And factory, and again, our notion of factory is completely different. A factory doesn't make tanks. You can make a factory, it can be 3D printing in your office. But again, it goes from the full life cycle of development, a real healthy cluster. So in MIT, it's like three different areas around MIT in Kendall Square, East Cambridge. This heart of it is MIT, but around are three different geographic areas, all built by different combinations of university, private, and government funding. All different combinations, each one making the right thing at the time. So that's the cluster. And everybody who sees Kendall Square now, they see these high-rise buildings with full of pharma companies. But it's all of that there. But the, the other thing to understand about the cluster, these clusters, they're only the nub, or hub, of the whole network. So this is, in effect, is what you have, is this cluster we just talked about around Kendall Square. But this is, again, what Mark was talking about. You work where you need to work and use resources. So it's in the existing hospitals, right? Because that's where you're clinically testing these things. And there are two clusters of hospitals. It stretches out into 
you know, different parts because it's more things become more expensive here, they move around the metropolitan area. So that's the cluster, right? But that's not the only part of the cluster. The cluster is in effect, here it is in Boston, Cambridge, but it's also in the suburbs and goes out here with the huge medical campus. This is the cluster. And I don't have a picture of it, but if you look at it, it's also worldwide. So you could argue whether Cambridge US or Cambridge UK are the best, you know, life sciences cluster. <laughs> you know, each side will have a good argument to make. But the fact is, half, they're working together. They're one, right? So that's what, a, what's what we're talking about when we talk about clusters. But again, the fundamental wills of innovation, and again, here's the human capital side of it. It's all housed in physical facilities, right? But so it's universities, MIT, Harvard, BU, Tufts, the life science companies, ICT companies, teaching hospitals, workforce, and venture capital. That's the ecosystem, I think the term was used a lot this morning, this afternoon. That's what we mean by that also. And again, I don't know if you can read this, but again, it has these core things I just read off. But also, a good cluster has, just like level 39, it has corporate funding, private support, industry liaison, federal money, government money, <coughs> foundation money, competition money. All these different sources of funds are there, and different balances in each cluster. But it also has this whole notion about entrepreneurship programs for students, for professionals. And you know, so all of this is happening. People are constantly mixing. Now, they talked about level 39 is on a bigger scale, same thing. So East London, in effect, the future of East London, there are now five or six of these hubs. They will eventually start working together. And as you build across the lake, the hub is going to be London, Cambridge and eventually perhaps Oxford. I don't know enough about that. But right now, you already see a strong link between, so that's, you forget Silicon Valley. I mean, it's a good model, a good performance. You're not gonna be Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley is 60 years old, and what few people know, it also is underpinned by the defense industry. All right, so there's as much defense industry going on as the other things. So you'll have your own, but we'll, all these pieces will be there. Human social capital, again, you have to attract people, you have to support their professional growth, you have to integrate talent, and you have to, this is an important word, enhance serendipity. We like to talk about serendipity. You're walking down the hall, and you meet somebody, and you have a conversation, and all of a sudden, you have a new company. Well, good luck. It happens occasionally. <laughs> but the chances of you walking through East London and meeting anybody of interest are very small. <laughs> so enhance serendipity. This is enhanced serendipity. People coming together to share some kind of common conversation, and it, it's an enhanced serendipity. So MIT is famous for work, working across organizational boundaries. The reality is nobody wants to work across organizational boundaries. They're too busy with their own work. They do it all the time because the problem demands it. There's no way to solve the problem without bringing dividends. You cannot have life sciences, new medicines, without doing it in a convergent way. So enhanced serendipity. Yes, you want to have, every building should have an atrium to go up and down the stairs and you beat somebody. I'm not knocking that. But that's not just serendipity. It has to be enhanced. It has to be reasons to bring people together or opportunities to bring people together. More than just social. So it's not just having great bars and socialization. So again, this notion about is it digital, is it virtual, is it real? Of course, it's both. And that's why I don't like the term smart cities. <laughs> We're not going to build dumb cities. Every city is going to be enhanced by the technology. Everything. Right? So it's a truck driver is going to behave differently. It's not just Uber drivers. It's truck drivers. It's cement makers. Cement pourers. Everything will be that. So again, we have to think of everything totally blended into physical and to social and to the virtual. Right? And you go back and forth seamlessly. And I think Mark held up his device. It's just amazing things now that allow you to do that faster and faster. The culture, this is interesting, a culture of innovation about crossing boundaries between organizations and disciplines. But it doesn't just cross the interdisciplinary collaborative. It's transdisciplinary in that they come together at the very beginning of a problem with different fields and perspectives and define the problem differently or the opportunity differently. It's permissive, very permissive. It allows things to happen. So again, you want your workplace to allow things to happen. The other thing is, one of the questions that came up this, this morning, I think you asked the panel, what more do you need in a place to make it work? You need to do something significant. If you look at a lot of these places, they're doing very insignificant things. Right? And you need very smart people. 
So, I mean, don't forget, a lot of things will fail because they're not significant. The market won't buy it. So significant things, life sciences are significant. Some of the technologies are significant. Social media, not all are. And this notion about always focusing on what is next. Real people who are, quote, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, innovators, they will always say, if I know it, it's not very interesting. <laughs> In MIT, we're famous for not competing with one another. We compete against ourselves and against the problem. It's like Groucho and Marx, the great comedian, once said, I didn't want to join that club. How good it could be if they invited me to join it? So a real entrepreneur is always looking, what's next, what's next, what's next? So I mean, this is just an example of New York City. This is the tip of Manhattan. This is not a cluster. This is what I call an innovation district. Used to be a financial district, and now the finance and moved Wall Street area, moved uptown. So this is what they call TAMI, technology, advertising, media, and information. It's a district, all right? It has all the characteristics of the big cluster, but the cluster in New York City is really, these don't exist unless you have the big companies uptown, the NBCs, the advertising companies. That's the cluster. And the cluster is now spreading all over, even though they're in different places, it lands. So that's about thinking cluster, again, layer upon layer upon layer. And so these are all the companies that are down there, all right? But again, this, what's interesting, these clusters should never be planned for one thing. Because we know in 20 years it'll be different, right? I mean, you know, compute, MIT at one point with this great cluster of mainframe computers. Well, we missed something called mini computers. So it was dead, now it came back. And I guarantee whatever you're doing in East London in 20 years from now, you'll be doing something different. So the notion of agility, agility, making places ready to change in the future, because you know, you don't know what's going to change, you know it will change. So all these great clusters. So again, if you look at Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley now is known as you know, social media primarily, right? But 40 years ago, it was the basic mini computers. It changes. And 60 years ago, it was all defense contractors. You know, it's still blown up. All right. So the other thing I just want to finish in effect is the platform itself is a laboratory. I talk to people who make places like Level 39 or the area around MIT or the area in East Cambridge, and there are others. I mean, like I work in Dubai and Seoul. And all of these places are in the placemaking, which is virtual and physical, is as innovative as any company within them. If you think of these as a real estate project, they're not. They're city making projects to propel an industry. And the last thing I'll say before I turn over to Peter is the one thing that all these places have is a narrative. There's a reason for being, just like Level 39 said, you know, we're focusing on FinCom, and then they build around that. So all these, and I'll give you the best example I know of a good, two good narratives. One is, is Abu Dhabi, the media zone. And their narrative is very simple. An Arab media for the Arabs, by the Arabs. And that stresses the whole strategy and all the tactics. Seoul Digital Media City was huge, 140,000 uh, companies, uh, 140, 140 companies, 160,000 jobs from, since, since two, year 2000. Their narrative is two things. One is to take digital media, because remember this is 2000, to apply digital media to all, digital technology, all the media industries to see them grow, right? And they knew it was going to change. But there's a separate narrative, and all these have double narratives. So in Abu Dhabi, it's not just the media industry, it's positioning Abu Dhabi and the UAE in the Middle East as a leader that is not a, changing the, the, the image of what the Arab countries are and building something beyond the petrochemical industry. If you look at Seoul, they did two things. One was to change the entire ecosystem of who creates. If you know Seoul, it's all dominated by Korea. It's dominated by the big companies. And the little companies can't grow. This place was created to allow little people to grow and to make new relationships between universities, big companies, and small companies. Right? It was driving. It was also to reposition Seoul as a global leader in innovation, not just in being the best producer of somebody else's technology. So these clusters are very big. They're very ambitious, they're very few, but the ones we're building now are jump-starting what took 60, 70 years to develop. They want to do it in a generation, and they are a generation. Here? So as um, Mike mentioned, uh, we're focused on sort of next generation innovation district uh, development. I serve on uh, three boards, one being the Accenture uh, Global Technology Vision Board, and we're focused on the future of technology as it relates to corporate development. 
Um, another board is the Series Board, which represents about $10 trillion of institutional investment focused on climate change and climate change technology. And the third is the Regional Plan Association. We're developing the 40-year infrastructure plan, which is our third, uh, fourth major plan to redevelop the New York region. And as Mike said, in New York now, in the last 15 years, we now have five innovation uh, clusters that grew from the dot-com era, but were, um, if you will, embryos as a result of some of the larger companies that were looking to innovate in New York. So for our panel yesterday, and these are some questions, and, and Mike, please interject as we go through these. These are the questions we're asking of municipalities, of innov innovation district uh, leadership, um, how do we grow and scale these districts? So Silicon Valley took 60 years. Uh, in New York, we're looking at a 10 to 15 year horizon of economic prosperity, innovation, job growth, and I'll talk a little bit about social equity, which is an important theme. How do we organize and enhance density, proximity, and collaboration? So these districts, in effect, as Mike explained, they don't happen by accident. And there are ways to enhance the recipe, as per Charles uh, Ledbetter's great presentation this morning, around what are the, the appropriate drivers and cultivators for innovation districts. Um, how do we align and leverage intellectual assets, economic assets, networking assets, and physical assets? New York benefits because of our density and our proximity to finance, and it's what I call the cool factor, which was brought up this morning. People want creative, fun places to live and work, especially if we're working 18 hours a day or having sleep problems for the earlier presentation. So this issue of the cool factor of New York and San Francisco is, is very attractive for not only millennial talent, but as Mike was describing, all levels of talent. So how do we align intellectual assets, networking assets, and talent into the physical construct of an innovation district? Um, what is the value of creative talent? and of human capital. So in New York, we're the only northeast and northern city in North America that's increasing in population. And I think this issue of uh, talent attraction, how do we engage uh, citizenry, how do we engage immigration, um, how do we build upon diverse populations, both intellectually and, and skill sets. And then finally, what are the key drivers that will contribute to future growth? And what are the accelerants to help accelerate innovation. So now, um, Mike and I will take you through a few of the themes from our panel. And these are success factors and challenges that were raised. And uh, we looked at the enhanced serendipity of innovation districts, which Mike outlined. There needs to be a purpose for these people coming together. And spontaneity and serendipity may be fine, but having a sense of purpose in terms of how a district and cluster is organized um, has, I think, tremendous benefits. There's an opportunity to reinvent traditional cluster ecosystems. So as Mike described, MIT is probably in its third generation of reinvention. Silicon Valley is probably in its fourth, which began as a defense uh, platform, if you will. Uh, in New York, we're moving from media and digital to life science pretty successfully in sort of a multimodal um, now understand, I mean, this differs from place to place. You have to figure out what your strengths are. And build upon those. Right. Um, innovation districts will draw upon new knowledge, and they'll create new knowledge. This is sort of the positive feedback mechanism. Uh, success tends to build more success with innovation and with innovation district growth. Um, to Mike's earlier point, developing a strong narrative and for the regional plan, we're developing our 40-year plan, and I keep emphasizing it's the story that we're telling the business community, we're telling 20-year-olds who come to New York, we're telling retirees who are coming to New York to retire in New York because of our good health care. What is our narrative and story? And I think we shouldn't underestimate the narrative in all of our lives in terms of why we do things. Um, emerging technologies and digital transformation will create new business opportunities. And Chris Kane from the BBC, who was on our panel, highlighted the digital transformation of media created a new innovation opportunity for the BBC to reinvent itself. So in the spirit of disruption, to Mark uh, 
uh, Gilbreth's earlier presentation on liquid space, the real estate industry, the workplace industry, has an opportunity to reinvent itself as a result of some of the disruption we're experiencing. Let me just add one thing, and I can't go further. This could take us two days to debate the whole thing. Digital technologies and will create business opportunities, but we, really what creates business technologies, are problems and opportunities in society. And digital technologies enhance your ability to do it. Now that, that's what I say, it's a long conversation, but it's both, okay? They create new opportunities, but it enhances us addressing. So, I mean, you talk about now, uh, now technology and biotechnology. The reason you look at biotechnology is we're getting older. People have chronic diseases yeah. they didn't have before because they died. I mean, so there are reasons to do it, and that's what will drive the real innovation. Um, the final two bullets here, collaboration must occur at a massive scale. And the scale of M MIT, the scale of actually the Cambridge, London uh, district. And finally, this point came out during our panel, that commercial real estate is rarely the catalyst. And you know, being part of the commercial real estate industry, we're often um, a bit late to the game. And perhaps we need to wake up and become earlier uh, engagers with innovation. Um, final slide. Um, these innovation districts are catalysts for new collaborative partnerships. A light touch is the best approach. These are not heavy-handed, uh, top-down, mandated uh, district developments. Um, at Accenture, we focus a lot on the physical and digital blur. And as Mike explained earlier, the physical and digital are equally important. Bioinformatics has replaced the wet lab in many uh, organizations and research organizations. So the blurring of the digital and physical is to certainly be enabled. Uh, workplace consumerization for our earlier liquid space uh, presentation is coming, and we're seeing the city as the new workplace. We're seeing the evolution of workplace networks. You know, I tell people I work from 12 devices, I don't work from an office, I work from the internet. Everywhere is my workplace. And within an innovation district, I think we'll see a lot more porosity and flexibility in terms of how people work to allow for open innovation and new collaboration. The one major point that was brought up by one of our colleagues that money follows the talent. Investment in companies, investment in real estate follows the smart, talented folks who are, are drawn uh, to innovation districts. And finally, um, citizens, citizens, citizens and their social equity. So we cannot have such disparity of wealth, which is what we're facing in New York. We have you know, 400 billionaires in New York and over 400,000 people go hungry every night in New York City. And this is another level of social equity that we need to start addressing because it can ultimately disrupt all of the social fabric that we've built to create not only innovation, but our overall economic prosperity. So um, with that, Mike? I just want to add one point. I mean, this sounds maybe a little bit soft, but it's really important. The nature of the problems and challenges we have in societies now all right, are very strong, very critical, and in many cases, very different than we've ever challenged before in a society. right? So what was interesting about a conference like this and others we go to, you're really hearing the best of practice now, the very best. And I say, grab it. But it's not enough. We really have to invent the future. And what these clusters are really about, and I think level, whether it's level 29 scale or the city scale, they're really not just about you know, capturing a business opportunity. The best of invent the future in a way we don't even know. And that's really a startling challenge. But I look at this audience, you know, you're of the age, Everything you do now is best practice, and 15 years from now, not so interesting, right? <laughs> 15, no, maybe five. But just grab that, start that as your base, and then invent the future. So, I, as I say, it sounds soppy, but it's true. <laughs> no, thank you. So with that, we'll close, and uh, open it up maybe for one question. question? Any time to question? Or no? Yeah. We have time? Yeah. Okay. One question. One question. Yeah. One question, that'd be a good one. <laughs> Better be a short one. <laughs> you can tell me what your question is and I'll repeat it. Steve Gell from Moser. Um, you were talking about enhanced serendipity and you, you, you said it's not having great bars, it's not having an atrium with a lift that goes up and down. So can you give us a clue to what you think it might look like? I will say it's not that it's not. That's necessary but not sufficient. Okay, you, you have to have those things, right? All those social and formal things. I mean, a great, a real sort of driving force 
is you want to solve a problem. Yeah. Right? Pfizer, I'll give you a specific example, Pfizer, the great drug company, just moved to our cluster in, in Cambridge. And they came there, one, because it's a place you have to be, you know, just where it is. But they're interested in two things, they're betting the future in two things. One specific aspect of Alzheimer's disease, one specific aspect of cancer, right? And they can name it in detail. And they know they can't solve the problem for themselves. They have to find other companies where they don't even know what they are. So they came and said, how do we do it? And people start saying, we'll have meetings. We'll bring together this company and that company and this company and that company. That's enhanced serendipity. It's not saying it's going to happen. We don't know. But you have enough of these talks. Enough of these talks, maybe something. But they would not have those talks just by walking down the street. You have to have meetings. You have to have society groups. You have to have MIT you know, courses about that stuff. That's enhanced serendipity. OK, on that note, of enhanced serendipity, uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you.